true crime friends. Welcome back to True Crime in Academia. I am your host, Mary DePippi. First of all, I hope you are all having a wonderful start to your week so far. If not, I hope it gets better for you. We are back on a Tuesday, a little late, but still back on a Tuesday. (laughs) You know, even though some of my stressful situations have gone away, the stress as you all know, still lingers. So I am still working through some of that. But for the most part, we should be back to Tuesday. I think. (laughs) Um, If any of you have seen my Instagram post like from a couple weeks ago, I had a big girl interview. And guess what? Your girl got the job. I am very excited to start this new chapter of my life. However, I'm not exactly sure what my schedule is. So until I kind of get that, (laughs) my schedule that is, um, True Crime and Academia might switch to another air date um, just, you know, to coordinate with all of that. But for the most part, I'm hoping it can stay on Tuesdays, but I will keep you guys posted on that and everything. But yeah, I'm very excited for this new chapter in my life. It has been a long time coming, (laughs) I feel like. And I'm just, I'm just ready. You know, I am ready for it. So anyway, this week I have a particularly special episode. We are not focusing on any crime in particular. However, I think it is a topic that needs to be discussed. Um, Specifically as a podcaster who focuses on crimes committed in academia, I feel like it would be irresponsible of me not to talk about this topic as I think it pertains to a lot of other issues that occur in the true crime world. So without further ado, let's get into it. Bullying. It is something we see on TV, in teen dramas, on television, or in movies. And it's something that is very much experienced in schools today. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines bullying as abuse and mistreatment of someone vulnerable by someone stronger or more powerful. But it is abuse. And at its core, you know, that's what bullying is. Like I said, it is abuse. But for whatever reason, when a child or teen or young adult is bullying someone, it's never treated with the same vigor as if it were an adult. People make allowances for bullies. That's obvious. And maybe it's because of their age. And I'm not saying that we need to throw the book at bullies or treat them as adults convicted of crimes, but it is an issue. Bullying or abuse of children by their peers never seems to carry the appropriate consequences. Bullied kids are often told to just ignore it or toughen up. Now, while I understand that valuing one's own self-worth and ignoring comments, hateful comments, of others is an important life skill, but these are life skills that even adults today still struggle with. So how are and how can we expect children, bullied children, to fully grasp this concept that most adults can't even grasp themselves. Bullying is such a multi-layered problem, and this is why I wanted to just take an episode to discuss it, because it obviously leads into more problems, problems that stem into adulthood. As a true crime aficionado, as a true crime scholar, as a true crime obsessed person, I know that hurt people hurt people. And bullying is just the beginning or a symptom of a bigger problem, which is, like I said, why I wanted to discuss this. So as we know, bullying is a worldwide issue. It is not just in certain countries, certain schools, certain states, whatever. It is worldwide. No one, and I literally mean this, no one is exempt from bullying or being bullied. It can happen to anyone and everyone. 
literally. And you would think that a worldwide problem like this, especially amongst our youth, would be something that was taken seriously. But it was only until 2005 that the U.S. government, the U.S. federal government, decided to actually investigate and log data on bullying. In the U.S. specifically, and sadly I'm not going to be able to go into like the worldwide statistics. I wasn't able to get them in time for this episode, so I am just going to focus on the U.S. specifically. But in the U.S., one in five kids report being bullied. And like with most statistics like this, we can assume that the number is higher because there's really no way of knowing the number of unreported cases and thus, you know, having a full number. But even still with this data of the children who have reported, one in five is a lot. A lot. That's at least, I mean, if you have a classroom of let's say, 30 kids. That's at least six kids being bullied in your classroom at any given time, based off of that statistic anyway. Now, bullying can also be differed by gender. Yes. And I know this sounds extremely sexist, but it is, you know, factually, the data shows this. And, you know, these I obviously these are more broad numbers, but and I don't have the nuances of other cases, but by gender, just girl, or I shouldn't even say by gender, by sex, female and males experience bullying differently. About 46% of boys and 26% of girls have reported to being in a physical altercation because of bullying. Now, generally, girls have reported being victims of rumors and just overall negative gossip, Whereas boys tend to report being more physically attacked. And again, I know I'm going to sound, I don't know, I guess maybe sexist because I do understand that gender is fluid and that, you know, we have more than just man and woman genders. And I don't want to come off as dismissive of that, but these are like the facts that I have based off of how these reports were done, you know. So, you know, obviously, if you were female presenting, you are considered a girl. If you are male presenting, you are considered a boy. I'm not trying to discount any other genders in this study. Like I said, I just want to reiterate, these are just the statistics that I have. And in some ways, it do, you know, it does make sense as far as the bullying styles go. You know, we tend to see girls or females, women presenting people to commit more psychological attacks of bullying. Whereas with male boys, male presenting, you know, people, they tend to be more physically aggressive. And again, I, I know I sound like I'm generalizing and stereotyping and I'm not meaning to. Again, these are just the facts and the statistics that I have. And obviously, this is not a blanket for everyone. This obviously, you know, as I said earlier, 26% of girls report having been in a physical attack. So I'm not saying that this is standard. This is just what the statistics have shown. And like I said, for, for some of it, it does make sense. However, I don't want anyone to go in with this thinking that this is a complete rule. You know, this is the standard, but there are a lot of other exceptions and different situations that aren't necessarily taken into account. And honest, and I can only report on or discuss about, you know, the things that are reported. Now... With these statistics that I've given you for kids, people think a lot of times that bullying just stops in grade school. And sadly, I'm here to tell you that no, it does not. We've just given it different names as we've gotten older. So let's get into bullying of college students. Look, Bumble knows you're exhausted by dating. All the must not take yourself too seriously, and 6-1 since that matters, and what do I even say other than, hey? 
<sighs> well, that's why they're introducing an all new Bumble with exciting features to make compatibility easier, starting the chat better, and dating safer. They've changed, so you don't have to. Download the new Bumble now. Like I said, bullying does not stop on the playground. It continues into adulthood. College students and adults tend to keep bullying cases to themselves. Of the reported cases, 4.2% of college students reported being bullied by a teacher, which, as someone who's had personal experience with this, I can say that this is not exclusive to just college. This can happen in grade schools, middle schools, and high schools, which I have to say is extremely fucked up. Obviously, with bullying, there is a perceived power imbalance, right? We have the bully who perceives themselves to be stronger, picking on someone who they perceive to be more vulnerable or less than. However, this is just what's perceived from a peer-to-peer point of view. It's just perceived, whether this person feels that way or not. Again, it's just perceived. It's not actual fact, right? Whereas we have college students being bullied by teachers. That is a literal direct power imbalance. You have a teacher who has all of the power in the classroom, has authority over their students, and authority over their grades. So unlike in grade school and in high school and middle school where the bully is perceived to have more power. In this situation, when a teacher is bullying the student, it's not perceived, it is known because of the reasons that I just listed. The teacher bully does have more power and therefore it can be extremely psychologically, even more so psychologically, detrimental to the person being bullied because the power of that teacher that bully is like I said it's more known you know you have students who basically don't report because they're afraid that their grades are going to suffer because of retaliation for doing so and which is not at all an unreasonable fear for a college student or any student who's being bullied by their teacher to have. Like I said, this is one of those situations of bullying where there is a direct power imbalance because of the fact that the teacher holds so much power over the student, which is why I say like relationships with teachers and things like sexual relationships, romantic relationships, they are never equal because of that power imbalance. Despite you know, how you want to believe, you know, that maybe that teacher isn't that way. It doesn't matter. That power structure is in existence and is in place. And it's still going to affect how, you know, just that power structure in general. But sadly, this that is the situation that students who are being bullied by their, that students that are being bullied by their teachers will face. Now, there are other forms of bullying that don't come from teachers, obviously, because, you know, Like we said, hurt people hurt people. So this is going to happen regardless of what age you are, as I had mentioned. One of the more popular ways of bullying in college is slut shaming, which I never, ever condone. Because that's a direct attack on, that is a direct attack on someone's sexuality and you know, sexual expression, and that's not acceptable. I mean, we see the double, bleh, we see the doubled standard all the time. Guys get praised for hooking up and sleeping with as many women as possible, whereas women are slut shamed. We're told, you know, we're sluts. We're too easy. We're this. We're that. And it's just unacceptable. It is. You know, how how is one one person because of their gender? Or their sex, I should say. You know, less, you know, risque because of their sex life versus another person. Just because of their sex organs. It makes literal no sense to me, but that's the patriarchy for you all. Anyway, another form of bullying 
in the very extreme cases are hazing. Now, not many sororities take part in this, but we know from all of the college movies out there that fraternities seem to really enjoy this process. And, you know, do I think some of it isn't good fun? You know, sure. Because let's face it, if you're signing up for a fraternity, you understand that there is maybe a certain level of hazing. However, I am not saying this to victim blame. There have been extreme cases of hazing that have just gone extremely too far that are detrimental and that are bullying. And that's unacceptable. Like I said, do I think, you know, quote unquote, hazing can be in good fun? Yeah, sure. I'm sure that there are certain things, certain pranks, whatever, that are not detrimental to the psychological and physical well-being of another person. But we've seen it time and time and time again when hazing has gone wrong and has actually led to death. And that is unacceptable. As we get older... The term bullying changes. And if you think, like I said, that bullying would stop at college, it doesn't. It continues in adulthood. We just call it by different things, such as harassment. In 2019, a study was done, which let me just say, it's already hard to believe that we lived in a time before COVID, even though considering we lived the majority of our lives before COVID, but Again, it's trauma, which we're going to get into that in a minute. I know you're all itching for me to discuss this, and I am itching too, but I'm just I'm trying to set us up here, okay? So let's get into adult bullying in the workplace. Like I said, we don't call it bullying. We call it harassment. And in the 2019 study, 2,081 employees were surveyed. 94% of that group reported being bullied multiple times in the workplace. And of that 94%, only 51% actually reported it, which I have to say, I was a little surprised that it was a little over half. But I think also as you become an adult, you know, you learn to not tolerate certain behaviors as much as maybe you would have in college or in middle school or in grade school, things like that. Bullying in the workplace can look like aggressive emails, gossip, or yelling, as reported by this study. Now, as we said, obviously, you know, this can, this bullying goes into adulthood. I know I've said it multiple times. You're probably sick of me saying that. But bullying has also taken a different appearance since, you know, movies and things. I feel like we've all been conditioned to think that bullying only takes place in schools or in colleges Or, like I said, in certain workplaces and that it's only in person and boom, that's it. That is obviously not true. In fact, 42% of children who said they were bullied said that they were bullied online. 35% of those groups of those kids said that they were actually threatened. And 58% of kids and teens said that someone was just mean to them online, which... Still not okay. Cyberbullying is actually reported to be the highest amongst middle schools. Nine out of ten tweens, teenagers, you know, use social media. I mean, we all know this. Everyone (laughs) uses social media today. And it has been on the rise for college students, obviously. However, I'm not sure how many people have reported that specifically. Which, again is sad. Because of this, victims of bullying are unable to get away from the consistent trauma and terror and abuse of being bullied. It literally can live with them their entire, like for entire days, weeks, months, years. And that's extremely unacceptable, obviously. I wouldn't be talking about it if we accepted this. So if anything, social media, the internet, has put bullying in the home and on the go. In dance recitals, in 
sporting events in anywhere, anywhere that you can access your social media and see that someone left a mean comment or threatened you or whatever, it's just given a bigger breeding ground. And look, the internet, social media has absolutely wonderful and great uses for all of us. Absolutely. I won't deny that. But it's clear that it has made bullying not only more accessible, but just can prolong the process and put people even through more emotional and physical distress. So what is it that causes bullying? As I said earlier, hurt people hurt people, and that is extremely true. Bullying is usually the effect of one being abused or neglected in some way, shape, or form, and in some cases, mental illness. Some of the main causes of bullying include early childhood trauma and parenting styles, which I thought was an extremely... (sighs) It just downplays, because honestly, if, if you have a child who is a bully, then in some way, shape, or form, they are being abused or neglected by you. And abuse and neglect... Sorry is not a fucking parenting style. I just want to make that clear. Like when I read that in the notes or in the sources for this episode, it literally made my skin crawl to call it certain parenting styles. Yeah, sure. Maybe a parent is not physically beating the shit out of their kid, but maybe they're calling them names. Maybe they're constantly pointing out that they are stupid because they make mistakes like everyone fucking does. Maybe they're not home enough to actually parent their child and therefore causing neglect. See, it's these reasons that maybe most of us don't see as super like extreme or, you know, as detrimental to a child's mental well-being. But it is. It just fucking is. This is, I'm sorry, this is just a point where I get really annoyed. Like I said, it made my stomach churn when I saw the word parenting styles or the words parenting styles. Because like I said, abuse and neglect, regardless of how minute those forms that you may be doing to your children, they still are what they are, abuse and neglect. It may not be as severe as someone else's, but you're still doing psychological damage to your child. (laughs) I mean, come on. We all know how vulnerable mentally children are. Our brains technically don't fully form until we're 25. Yeah. Basically, like, you can rent a car at 25. But you can do a whole bunch of other shit before then. And your brain is still not fully formed. Hell, you can pump your body with all the amounts of alcohol you want before your brain is fully formed. Side tangent, this is why our government does not look out for us. Or else they would not make rules like this that say, oh yeah, you're 21, let's pump you full with a chemical that can totally destroy and damage your brain functioning down the road. But it's okay, your brain's not fully formed yet, so you know, you might not even need to use those things. I know that's extreme, but that's, it just feels like that's what the point is. But that's what I'm trying to say with people who hurt their kids. They may not think that what they're doing or how they're treating their children is going to affect the outcome. But yes, it is because of where they are in their psychological development. This shit has way more of an impact than people like to realize because we're constantly pushing forward that children are resilient, children are resilient, and yes, they are, but to a certain extent. Because if you're being made fun of by your parent, and picked on every day, you're not going to have a good sense of self. You're not going to have a high self-esteem. And you're going to take that out on someone else, most likely. Not everyone, but most likely you will. And this, again, is how bullying starts. And I just think it's true that bullying can be prevented in the home. But that's my own personal take. That is not anything medical. I don't have any statistics to back that up. That is just my own personal opinion. 
Now, how does bullying affect those not only who do bully, but those who are bullied? Well, you might be surprised to learn that bullies and their victims tend to have the same outcome in their futures. Both groups tend to engage in risky behavior and are more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol as adults. In severe cases, bullies and those who have been bullied can go on to abuse their romantic partners, children, commit crimes, and engage in sex earlier. Obviously, from a psychological standpoint, I feel like this should be a surprise to no one, but the effects of bullying for both the bully and the person being bullied can cause increased depression and anxiety and in some cases lead to death by suicide, which that is the big one. And I would say that that is most consistent from my research as a result of people who are being bullied. Because if you're constantly, like I said, being put down by someone at such a young age when your brain is not fully formed, The notion of ignoring what they're saying just does not compute. And therefore, they take it seriously and they start to have negative views of themselves. Sometimes so negatively that, like I say, it can, that, like I said, it can lead to death by suicide. Now, bystanders are also affected by bullying, by witnessing bullying, I should say. They also experience increased substance abuse and alcohol abuse as well as increased anxiety and depression because witnessing trauma can be traumatic for the viewer. And I think that is something that we don't discuss enough. And while I understand it is important to really hone in on the psychological effects of bullying for those bullied and those doing the bullying... I feel like those who are the bystanders who experience these things often get lost in the cracks. Because again, and I'm not even saying this from a doctor standpoint, I think also as the bystander, you feel that, you know, it didn't happen to you. And you weren't, you know, you didn't do the bullying. You weren't the one being bullied. Why are you so upset by this? You know? And I think they start to doubt their own experience and their own understanding of the experience and think that maybe what they're feeling, because like I said, witnessing trauma in that way can be very traumatic for the viewer, even though they are not the ones experiencing the trauma, they're still witnessing it. And that still has detrimental effects on the viewer. But like I said, because I think a lot of people are so focused on the bully and the bullied, the bystanders often feel like they are not important and that their trauma is not significant, even though it very much is. Because as I just said, (laughs) witnessing trauma can cause trauma. Just because you're not the one experiencing directly the trauma, there is still trauma being experienced. Jesus, how many times can I say trauma (laughs) in this episode? Oh my goodness. But yeah, so those are the general basic statistics on bullying. And like I said, I really just wanted to take time to discuss that because obviously, you know, with the school year just starting and everything like that, bullying is an issue and an issue that leads to other problems, you know. Like I said, you know, we know as true crime people that hurt people hurt people. We see this pattern over and over and over and over again, especially with serial offenders. Usually these serial offenders were victims of bullying, whether it be by their own peers, whether it be by a teacher, whether it be abuse from their own parents, abuse slash bullying by their own parents. We see how this correlates with violence and drug use in their adulthoods. And I know the drug use is concerning, but obviously I would argue that the violence against others is a more pressing issue not to you know say that one issue is worse than the others however and I feel gross even saying this you know when a hurt person hurts themselves that's one thing when they take it out on others 
that's another thing. Both are bad. However, I don't ever appreciate the idea of bringing someone else into your trauma. And I don't mean like talking to them about it. I mean by physically hurting someone to take out your trauma on. That's not okay. But there is hope. There have been studies in schools that actually implement anti-bullying classes, seminars, things like that. The rate of bullying goes down as much as 25%. So I think that there is value in awareness. Because I think that that is the main point of these seminars, you know, is to bring awareness to the problem of bullying. Because I think, you know, again, when you're starting off at a young age, hurting other people, you might not realize the damage that you're doing until someone tells you. So I think the awareness factor also for bystanders to understand that, you know, That they have power to do something as well. I think that's another factor. Because if they're aware that they have power to stop a bad situation, they might want to actually take that power. And I think that that is super important for them to learn and, you know, to manifest. Because, again, the more that people know what's going on, the more people can step in to help and do something. So... With that, my dears, I know that was a very (laughs) long-winded discussion of bullying. I I will have resources for those of you who are experiencing bullying in any way, shape, or form. I will have those in the description notes or my show notes at the bottom. Please utilize that if you are a victim of bullying and, you know, because I want you to get help. People need help. Or even if you are a bully, there I will have resources for you too. So you can stop and learn how to deal with the source of your pain in the right way, you know? So I have sources, like I said, for both bullies and people who are being bullied. If you are in that situation, I really hope you do use them because I think it's something that can be prevented and dealt with with a lot of empathy and compassion. So with that, my dears, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe out there. Do all of the things. Don't forget to follow True Crime and Academia on social media, on TikTok and Instagram. I am True Crime and Academia. And on Twitter, I am at TC in Academia because Twitter hates all the extra characters. Boo! Also, I will have a new Patreon-exclusive episode coming out at the end of the week, so stay tuned for that. And until next week, my loves, I will see you later. Thank you so much for listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Welcome to the fall season. The Ivory Tower Boiler Room is a public humanities podcast where we interview writers, scholars, performers, and artists episodes air on Mondays. I am Andrew Rimby, the executive director. I'm so happy to welcome my team, Mary DePippi, our chief contributor, Kimberly Dallas, our editor, and an amazing fall group of interns. Thank you to this team. Please follow the Ivory Tower Boiler Room on TikTok and Instagram at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Easy to remember. Our Twitter is at Ivory Boiler Room. And we have a whole new design for our Patreon. It is called the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe because you're joining us and eavesdropping on our conversations that are unedited videos of all of our Ivory Tower Boiler Room episodes as if you're eavesdropping in a cafe overhearing the conversation. Well, talking about overhearing a conversation, hi, Mary. Hello, Andrew, and hello, everyone. I'm Mary DePippi, the host of True Crime and Academia, a podcast, well, a true crime podcast that is focused mainly on the crimes committed by and to those in the field of academia. Episodes air every Tuesday at noon. You can follow True Crime and Academia on Instagram and TikTok at True Crime and Academia and on Twitter at TC in Academia because Twitter hates extra characters, as we all know. And as Andrew alluded to earlier, we have a Patreon, and True Crime and Academia has exclusive bonus episodes for subscribers. 
as a true crime enthusiast, I don't necessarily like to pigeonhole my true crime interests. So over on the Patreon, I cover some of the more high profile cases not related to academia, such as the murder of John Benet Ramsey and the case of Casey Anthony. So if you want access to videos like that, go over to patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room and become a subscriber. Thank you all for joining us. And here's to an amazing fall season. Bye. Bye everyone.